All right, so we're going to continue in our book of Acts. Now, we've been saying this over and over again. The message of the, the book of Acts is the, it's the message of God. I mean, it's all about God. That's, he's the one that initiated the work. He's the one that sent Jesus Christ, being Jesus Christ himself. He's the one that raised Jesus Christ. And, of course, that's really the, the main theme that runs through the book is the resurrected. Now, we've touched on this idea of the resurrection several times to this point. But today, what we're going to look at in, in Peter sharing the gospel with Cornelius and really his entire household, this becomes sort of the pivotal point for that entire conversation there because it's that point that separates, as we've been saying repeatedly, and it's important for you to remember this. If you want to know the difference between Christianity and all other religions, it's the resurrection. We're, we're the only ones that hold to that belief um, as, it's, as it is recorded for us in the scripture. So this, this idea of the resurrection which makes uh, what the scripture teaches unique is the thing that the apostles, and as they move out from even here in this place with Cornelius and move out, this idea of the resurrection is going to keep popping up and is going to show up in some very strange places. Here it's going to show up in a coastal city called Caesarea. We've already seen it show up in Jerusalem. We've seen it show up in the surrounding area and areas that we would call today Jordan the country of Jordan, but in those days, of course, it was, it was different all, all the way up north into Galilee, up around the Sea of Galilee. It had moved uh, all around as the gospel spread, and the message was different because it contained the, the teaching of the resurrection. And so, so this becomes this real, real pivotal point, and when we, when we get here to this, this city on the, on the beach, so to speak, and the message comes out, we're going to see that it's going to even expand. And then Paul is going to take that same message. He will be the one that ultimately the Lord will call. We'll see this when we get over to chapter 16. But the Lord is going to call Paul with what we call the Macedonian call, which of course for us is Greece. And it was the first time that God would take the, the gospel out of what we call the Middle East and take it into what we call Europe. And it would be into Greece. And lo and behold, the first place it would enter would be a place called Athens. Yes, that Athens. A place of, of great philosophy, great thinkers, the intellects not only of those days, but of our days. And all of the religious and all of the other things that were gathered there. And Paul, once again, is going to, going to reason with these guys. And he has them. Because you can't argue with the, the wisdom that comes from the scripture. And he has them. They're listening to him until he brings up the resurrection. And the minute he brings the resurrection in, they just, they just lose, at least some of them, um, lose interest and go. And so this, this idea of the resurrection is so important. It's so significant to everything that we believe. Okay? If the Lord Jesus Christ just died on the cross for us, that's a wonderful thing. It is. That somebody could love us that much. But if he's still in the ground, then he's no different than any other human being. But he's not in the ground. And we're getting ready to celebrate that in April this year again, right? As we move into the Easter season. It's kind of the perfect timing. So this is really the significance of what we're going to be talking about. Now remember where we are here. Peter has gone out of Jerusalem. He's gone west to the coast, the Mediterranean Sea, the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. He's visited a couple of cities there. He's been to Joppa. Um, he's been to uh, a couple of cities on the way there. And God has done tremendous things. And the word of the gospel and who Jesus was and what Jesus did, even the quote-unquote myth that Jesus was raised from the death had preceded Peter. This was something he was finding as he goes around in the villages. And it's while he's in Joppa and he's staying with this fellow by the name of Simon, not Simon Peter, but Simon the Tanner. Um, remember the guy that, that took care of leather and stuff, and messed with uh, the skins of animals and made sort of all sorts of things. And this is where Peter was, was hanging out when he was in Joppa because it's also on the coast about 30 miles south of uh, Caesarea. And so, so he's hanging out there. Well, while he's there, he's up on his roof, as we talked about, um, on the third hour. And I may have made a mistake last week. I don't remember exactly what I said. Um, but I think I said the ninth hour was noon, but it's actually not. It's three o'clock. I hope I didn't mess that up. Did I say noon? Yeah. Or did I say three? Okay. Because I'm thinking, did I say noon? I've got to clarify that. But understand, the ninth hour is three o'clock. That's right, because it's the sixth hour. Yeah. Okay. Sixth hour is six o'clock. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, this is all very confusing, isn't it? 
But Peter's up there, so let's just, let's not worry about the hour thing. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, okay? He's gone up there. Everybody's down in the house at Simon's. They're getting ready, dinner, lunch ready, and he's up on the roof, and he's just sort of laying up there and relaxing, catching the breeze off the sea and, and sort of relaxing. And the Lord ends up showing him this incredible vision of the sheet coming down out of heaven. And we talked about this and the significance of that. And we stressed last week that for you and I, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you're Peter, and the only thing you've ever known is that which has come from, from the law, and all of a sudden you're seeing this thing, and basically the Lord is telling you to do something that's breaking the law. You would be a bit confused as well. So three times the Lord reminds him of this, and we said that uh, as he's pondering this, three guys show up and are, are asking for him. Well, that's because the day before that, at the exact same hour, uh, when Peter was up on the roof, this guy in Joppa, uh, I'm sorry, Cornelius in Caesarea is also sees a vision and an angel comes and says, hey, send guys down there to get Peter. He's going to come here and he's going to tell you what you need to do. And that's where we are. So everything's happening around this noon appointment idea. So now last week, we know that after this happens, Peter's not understanding. And lo and behold, there's three guys, three Gentiles, two servants of this Cornelius and the centurion of all things. Oh my gosh, there's a Roman soldier at the door. You know, doesn't sound like a lot to us, but if you were a Jew in those days and a Roman soldier showed up at your door, it was probably not a good thing. It's like the IRS coming knocking, right? So, so they go down and they answer the door and they ask for Peter and Peter comes down and they tell him what had happened, as we said, and, and Peter says, okay, I'm going to go with you. We'll leave, you know, we'll leave tomorrow morning first thing, or actually uh, after, after lunch, they'll, we'll head out. And so that's exactly what they do. So they're, they've been on that journey and we talked about that. Remember, it's about a 30 miles, so they can make it roughly in, uh, you know, a day and a half or so. And uh, so Peter takes some of the guys from the little church there in Joppa and uh, the three guys with himself, so there's 10 guys all together. Um, and they're starting to make the journey now north, right up along the PCH. They're going up Pacific Coast Highway. Um, but anyway, they're going up there, and they're, they're going from Joppa up to Caesarea. That's, that's where they're headed. And we talked about the significance of that journey, because this is, this is kind of a motley crew, pardon the pun, um, that's making, now we're speaking about LA and PCH, and we bring in motley crew. Anyway, um, so we're... Some of you might not get that, and that's a good thing, trust me. Um, but we're, they're, they're moving up there, and you can imagine this, this conversation and the, sort of the, uh, everybody would be watching this. This is totally unusual. There's a Roman soldier in this group, and he's got two clear servants of somebody that's obviously a person of some means, and then there's these six Jews walking along with them. It's like, this was a sight to behold in those days. You, you just, this didn't happen. So this is an indication that something is getting ready to change. So they've made that journey, and, and by the time they get there, of course, they camp for a little bit. By the time they get there, it's now noon the following day, and that's where we pick up the story here. And the following day, they entered Caesarea, okay? Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and his close friends, and, and Peter was coming in, or as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, and he fell down at his feet, and he worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up and said, dude, he didn't say dude, he just said, stand up. I myself, am I'm, I'm also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. And then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company uh, with or go to one, um, one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came, notice, without objection. Something is changing, okay? There's a change in the wind. As soon as I was sent for, I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? Now that sounds strange. We already know he knows why he's there. Well, let's go back and look at this a little bit closer and see what's happening. We already understand the whole following day thing. They entered Caesarea, but look at this. Now Cornelius was waiting for them, okay? So this guy is pacing the floor. He's expecting them with great expectation. I mean, after all, we learned last week that he had been praying for apparently some time as a man who was not a believer, as a man who was not a Jew. He's a Roman centurion for goodness sake. He's a commander in the armies of Rome. I mean, this, is, this guy has some serious, serious authority. But we're told that he was a good man. He was a gentle man. He was a compassionate man. He was a kind man. 
And he always took care of those that were, were down and out in the city of Caesarea. I mean, here's this military commander walking around town, and he's doing what we're getting ready to do in Vegas. He's carrying those little bags around. You should pick them up and carry them with you. And helping the people that are on the streets. And he's taking care of people and making sure they're fed, making sure they're taken care of when they're sick. He's a good man. Because he has understood that the gods of Rome aren't gods at all. They're just little statues. They have no power. They have no authority. They never answer the prayers when we, when we make our offerings to them. They don't do anything for us. And yet we continue to give them reverence. He had come to the end of his rope, as obviously many other Romans had as well. You've got to get sick of that kind of thing, playing the game. Wearing the certain clothes, doing the certain bow, singing the certain songs. Worshipping the same gods who demand that you do this. And well, if your child is sick, well, you didn't give enough, so you got to give more. Sound familiar? You see, nothing has changed. We just have created gods of our own. But in those days, so if you were a Roman or anybody even today, you just get sick of this. It's always the gods want more, they want more, they want more. The religion wants more, it wants more. It wants more. Tithe more, give more, be more obedient. Prayer for obedience this week, right? Be more obedient to what's going on and, and stuff like that. That's what religion does, man. Whether it calls itself Christianity, Judaism, Islam, or any of a, a pantheon of other, uh, you know, other gods, it's all the same. That's the problem with religion. It demands and it expects. It wants you to be different. You've got to do this to be acceptable. You've got to wear this. You've got to say this. You've got to sing this. Ay, 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 ay. Have we never studied what Jesus, these, to these people, have you never studied the life of Jesus? Show me one instance where he ever did this. He never did, did it like this. He never had expectations of anyone. He was so unlike those other people that even the children were drawn to him. Even the ones that were probably sick and hacking, like my grandkids at home. That's how he was. He was so different. And then people are going to claim that we want to follow Christ when we're going to put up all of these walls of separation, completely opposite of what he taught us. We're going to see a wall broken down here in just a few minutes. Sad, sad, sad. Actually pathetic, if you really want to know. It really gets quite irritating. But this guy is waiting. He was this religious man, and they, they had failed him, and he had been praying. Now we're going to see in a few minutes that his prayer seems to be singly focused. He was a man that was doing these things because he understood. He understood that the God of Israel was God. Because he was a God of mercy and a God of compassion. Didn't matter whether his people were. So you always look at the people and try to determine how good the God is based on the people. That's a sad case if people are looking at you and I trying to find a representation of the Christ, isn't it? Kind of scary. But that's what happens. It always happens that way. And so he understood that the God of Israel... He'd, there's no doubt, Peter's going to remind us, that he had already heard about this guy, Jesus. He had known what happened with the Jews and with Rome. He's in Caesarea. He's not, you know, across the world from where all this took place. And he's been here for some time. Okay, because he's a, he's a commander. He's, you know, he's probably been in there 10 years plus. So, so he's understanding all this. And his prayer had been, God of Israel, I want to know you. I want to understand you. And he's, he's crying out repeatedly. And it's not until that day that we just talked about that the angels appears before him and said, Relax, Cornelius. God has answered your prayer. And all that you've done has come up before him. Wow, there is a God. And he does listen. See, that's what's happening here. Now, he's a commander. He has sent servants to go get Peter. And he expects those servants to bring Peter. He's not expecting a two-day journey. You send as a commander one of, your, one of the, those that are uh, in, in your ranks, and you send them to do an obligation, and you put a time frame on this, then they better be back on that time frame. Okay? It's, it's the discipline of the military. So, so he's expecting this. You can see there. He's waiting for them. But he's waiting with anticipation and expectation. He says they need to be back, and according to my watch, they should be getting here any time. This is what you do when you're a commander. Remember we talked about the last time, or last week, the, the other time, when a, a Roman commander of the military had an encounter. But this time was with Jesus. Remember that? We talked about that with the sick servant. And Jesus said, yeah, I'll go with you and pray for the guy. And the guy said, no, no, no. 
You just, you just say it to get done and it'll get done. And then remember we talked about last week, Jesus was blown away. I've never seen anybody like this in all of Jerusalem. So he said to the centurion, yeah, well then go, your servant is healed. And the servant said, thanks, man. Whew, off he goes. See, people in authority expect action. And this is what this guy was doing. He was expecting. It. So he's waiting for them. But notice the second thing that he's done, and he called together his relatives and close friends. He brought the whole gang. Just, not just the people in his household, his family members, probably extended family members, and friends. Who are these friends? Well, he's Cornelius. He's a pretty good dude. So probably he even had some, possibly some, some friends that were even Jewish. We don't know. We're not told. But there's, there's a pretty good-sized crowd that's here waiting. And as, as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, and he fell down at his feet, and he worshipped him. Now, understand what's happening here. Cornelius is a military commander. He, respe he expects respect. As a military commander of Rome, you worship Caesar because you got to remember this, you guys. Caesar's claim to be God. All of the world empire leaders did. All of them. Pharaoh did. He claimed to be God. That's why God sent Moses and show, go show Pharaoh. He ain't God. And neither are the other gods that he thinks he's above. There's ten of them. Okay? Pharaoh himself thinks he's a god, and there's ten gods in Egypt. You go and show them they ain't gods, and neither is Pharaoh. That's the issue that's at stake there. The Assyrians, my gosh, the Babylonians, these guys all, all these world rulers, these guys that led, led these empires, exalted themselves to be divine in nature. They thought they were above uh, the, all of the other men. Certainly was the case with the Caesars. So Cornelius was used to being in the presence of Caesar, who viewed himself as God, and it was even um, uh, Nero, who even said uh, his horse was de deity. Even his horse was a god, so they had to treat his horse like this. I mean, these people are not, was it Nero? I'm, thinking, I'm not thinking it was Nero, I think it might have been Caligula. But anyways, whatever. They were all nut jobs, let's just put it that way. Okay, your horse ain't a god. I don't care how pretty it is. But that's what they thought. And so... This is a natural thing for Cornelius to do. He's not worshiping Peter as God. He's already seen a messenger from God, an angel. Remember, angel means messenger. A messenger from God said, send, go get Peter. So he realizes that Peter's somebody in authority that's obviously above him. That's all he's doing here. He's not deifying Peter. He's simply recognizing this, and he's, he's paying honor. I mean, obviously, Peter's somebody special. An angel said to go get him. So he's not your normal guy. There's something about this guy. Now, he has yet to learn what it is. Peter's a dork just like the rest of us. But there was a call on Peter's life as there is on ours. So he falls down and, and worships in his feet. And Peter lifted him up saying, stand up. It's really interesting when you read this in the original. It's like Peter literally was like shocked. Whoa. And he reaches down and grabs the dude. And I believe, as you guys have said, it's probably Peter, some, a big guy, probably like me. That's why I like to hang out with Peter. You know, we can eat. Nobody would water, worry about us slobbering and stuff when we eat. That's just the kind of guys we are. But he, it's written that when it happened, he, when he said, stand up by myself, that he actually grabs a hold of him and stands him up. See? And then he says, look, I'm just a man. He's just saying, in other words, I'm a human being. Don't even think about this. Okay? Now, if you're Cornelius, this is a little bit of a, well, I was just trying to, you know, honor your position. Well, Peter would go, yeah, well, I, I, I get it, dude, but, but seriously, man, we're the same, okay? God has just asked me to do something, that's all. So, and as he talked with him, he went in and he found um, whom had come together. Now, so you've got this incredible encounter. Peter's off balance, Cornelius is off balance. Everybody's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And they're all talking about this. And then you got these six, these six probable Jews from Joppa with Peter that had made the journey. Remember the other six guys. Can you imagine their faces when this dude dropped at Peter's feet as Jews? You weren't supposed to bow the knee to any God if you were a Jew. And later it was changed. You don't even bow the knee to any man. So if you're six Jews, even if you're a Christian Jews, you're still, as far as you know, living by the laws of Moses with ob some obvious changes. And all of a sudden, there's Peter, and you respect Peter. He walked with the Lord, for goodness sake. He knows him personally on an intimate level. And, I, and you're with Peter, and all of a sudden, this Gentile commander falls down. Those guys just must have went, ah! Can you just imagine what this must have been like? Ooh, yeah, yeah. 
So now it's all kind of settled down. The dust is settled. Everybody's BP is, you know, settling down. Their pulse is resting. And the, you know, respirations are coming back to normal. And he, I love this. And he went and he found many who had come together. This, again, is written that he was shocked. He thought he was coming to hang out with Peter. Oh, shoot, Cornelius. And he walks in. And there's a big old crowd there. It's like, wow, that was unexpected. See, that's what's happening here. He was not expecting this. But it only makes sense. If God is going to call us and position us to be in a place to use and to teach the gospel to those who may not know him, we shouldn't be surprised that he'll gather several people together. So this was obviously that group that we were talking about before, the friends and relatives of Cornelius, who, like Cornelius, had had enough of the Roman gods, had half, had enough of the Roman Caesar, a guy that claims to be, that claims to be uh, a god, is, is, is setting Rome on fire and running around like a madman in a chariot burning people alive. What kind of God is that? You know? Kind of worshiping his horse. Jeez. So he finds many who had come together. And so now you can kind of see it. Once again, he's kind of staggered. And then he says, and I love this, because when you first read this, it sounds like Peter's kind of being kind of, kind of rude here. Well, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. You know? Whoa. So if you're in that room, it's like, oh, here we go again, the Jews. They're always like this. They think they're better than everybody else. Don't want to be in the same room. Don't want to be in the, in the same thing. I don't, I don't want that God either. You know, one time I was coming back. It was about uh, the time before Marine went with me to Mozambique. And I was on a plane. And I don't, I don't remember where, which, which leg of the journey it was. But I think it was from, from Johannesburg coming back this way. But anyway, as I was getting on the aircraft, there was this big commotion going on. And I was confused with what's happening. I mean, you're in a foreign country getting on an airplane. You don't, last thing you want to see when you get on an airplane is commotion. Okay, that's not a good sign. Or the guy walking out, but out the, when you look out the window and he's walking under the plane and he's got out a crescent wrench. It's like, uh, excuse me. <laughs> no. But anyway, so there's this commotion going on. Well, as I'm boarding, because these things are huge, and I'm walking to this thing, I, I pass these people. He turns out, and I and understand where I'm going with this. This man was a, was an Orthodox Jew. He was a young man. He was probably mid-20s or so. Looked exactly like you see on TV. The little curly things, the hat, the whole thing. He's wearing his little deal and stuff. And come to find out, he's just upset because he had purchased a ticket. And now he's got to sit next to a woman on this long flight who is not married. And I will not sit with that woman. I will not sit next to an unmarried woman. And he's making this big commotion. And the poor flight attendants, you know, that they're, they're foreigners to begin with, are trying to figure out, well, we're going to try to get you a seat. Well, i got to get a seat. It better not be with another. And this guy's acting like this. And I, I tell you, I just wanted to go up and say, you know what? You know what? This is why people don't want to know your God, dude. Because you act like this. You know what? I have, don't have any desire to know your God. I want to know the God of Abraham. But I don't want nothing to do with your God. Because he is obviously not the same as the God that Abraham worshipped. Because Abraham would have never done this. Moses would have never done this. Isaac, Jacob would have never done this. They wouldn't have done it. You know, good grief. King Solomon would have never done this. When the foreigner comes in, accept them, listen to the prayers. And this is how you act? Sad, sad. Well, that's what we're talking about. See, this is the view in those days as well as today. These people won't have anything to do with you. Because they're stuck in the law. And according to the law, under the religion of Judaism, you can't, you can't come anywhere near uh, anybody that's around you. Well, if you're supposed to represent God as a nation to the world, how the heck are you supposed to do that if you never have any action, interaction with them? I mean, common sense has got to enter the picture at some point. But that's what happened. And so Peter knows. He's just come into a crowd. And they're just, you know, uppity Jew kind of thing. So it sounds like that's what he's saying, but that's not the way it's written. I think he had a great big smile on his face as he walks in and he sees the crowd. He said, do you guys have any idea how unlawful it is for me to be here? This is way cool. Because look at the last statement. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So I think he's expressing to them, look, under normal circumstances and in the past, this is the way that it was. I, would, I could never be here. Not only would I not want to be here, you wouldn't want me here. You guys would have to ditch the bacon on your burgers. See? 
So no, you wouldn't want me here. But something has changed. And he's saying to them, do you understand what's happening here? God has explained something. And notice what he says to me. There's no expectation that they're going to understand. Peter was slowly but surely learning what the sheep meant. It was all these people in this room. But Peter, prior to that, would have said, unclean, unclean, unclean. I will not enter that house. That's what he would have said just a few days before. Not so now. God has shown me I should not call. Therefore, he was starting to get it before. This is, now he's looking back to there. So because of that, I came without objection. You know, normally, if those guys had showed up two days before, I would have said, listen, tell your court, you know, this guy, he sounds like a really cool guy, but I can't come and talk to him. I just can't. I'd be breaking the law. I would be defiling myself. You know, they could go to church. You get it, right? That's what was happening. But he's saying, listen, because God was starting to show me something. I didn't fully get the whole sheet thing. But I was starting to understand. So when these guys ask, I've seen the sheet. I've seen three times, three Gentiles. I'm thinking, wow, maybe I should go with these guys. And then they tell him the story. Right? So he's like, I made no reservations. I just took the next sandal out of town. Whatever. I'm going to say next boat out of town. You know, anyway. So therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for now, he, now here's the important question. This sounds, again, like Peter's being rude. Well, Peter, you know why you're here. But you see what Peter is doing? And no, notice, remember that he's doing this through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is just using Peter, because Peter apparently was an easy guy to understand. And so, so Peter now says, well, so, so now explain to me why I came. Why? Did you send for me? Why was it important for you to bring me here? It's not that he doubts what he's been heard. I think he wants Cornelius now to say it, to explain. You see, so that there's no, you know, maybe the servants didn't get the story right. Maybe, you know, maybe they elaborated on it as they made the journey south to Joppa to get me. And, you know, so maybe it's changed a little bit. So you know what, Cornelius? I came when these guys asked, so, so you know what? You give me your version kind of thing. No doubt, no, no criticism, just, just reality. So here Cornelius goes. Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. Now if you've noticed anything in the context of this whole scenario, there's a lot of noon appointments taking place. I love lunch appointments. Nothing better than meeting with someone over lunch. But that's what's happening. You know, it's, it, it's happening. Uh, it's really not noon, it's afternoon, but you get the idea. Um, but notice what has taken place. The first time... This, uh, uh, something happened at this particular hour was uh, the angel and Cornelius. We already talked about that, the little sort of the interview, the angel telling him what he needed to do. The second time, the very next day, is the Lord himself appearing to Peter with the sheet incident, same hour. Okay? They journey and, and, they're, uh, and then the servants get there at the same hour the following day, which is the three days now, and then, and then they tell him the story once again, and now Peter's made the journey back for the fourth day at the same hour. It's almost like God has a plan. Wow. Isn't that amazing? So Cornelius said, look, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. Notice he's in the house. He's not a Jew. He can't go to the temple. But he understood the prayer times of the Jews. And when they were seeking their God, he would join their voices to them. Even though he couldn't be in their presence because he was a Gentile. And not only that, he's a Roman. And not only that, he's a Roman commander. You know, the occupiers. So I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. So we understand now that the angel appeared like a man. The messenger that came up and had this message looked like a man. This is, angels often do this. We're, we read it over and over again. You know, they're not men. Their creation was different than ours, but they are a created being. They just exist on a, on a different plane than we do. They, their ministry is within the spiritual realm. Though at times, when God, when God wills it, they enter into the physical realm to speak to us because we do not have the ability to sort of recognize them. That's why Paul takes great pains to tell us that there really is a spiritual world. So you're going to have to come to terms with that. And so, but from, from their perspective, they're able to go from the spiritual into the physical as God directs. We are not, okay, until the Lord calls us out because we were created with the body, 
to function within the realm of creation. We are created physically to function within the physical. Okay? But we also were created in the image and likeness of God. So therefore, we also have an ability to communicate with God from within the physical. Prayer. God's word, his ministry to us. That's, that's how it all works. So, okay. And we have the ability, like God, to reason. We're a triune being like God is. We're spirit, soul, and body. He's Father, Son, and Spirit. The three are the same one. And I know we have, everybody has a hard time where we just can't explain the Trinity. I think you can. <laughs> we have a triune God who's created us in his image and character. Want to understand God? Where else would you look? Not at an egg. Cool example. I like the cherry pie one myself. But you get the, you know, all these descriptions. Look, you're a triune being, so deal with it. <laughs> okay? This is flesh. But it isn't the real you. When the real you departs, this goes... Okay? But you're the same person, are you not? But it's the real you that makes this work. <laughs> you get the idea. It's the real me that's going... And you guys are hearing this. Okay? That's the soul. My mind, my will, and I, my emotions. And it's expressed through my physical being. Through my, my body. Through with my voice. And so on and so forth. But there's also a side of me because I have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I have the ability, my spirit is alive. Unlike before I was, had a relationship with Christ, I couldn't understand the things of God because I didn't have the spirit. My spirit was dead. But Jesus said, I'm going to come and God has sent me so that you can be born again spiritually. My spirit has been made new and now there's an open communication between me and God. And that communication comes out through my soul and stuff and it's expressive in my actions from up here at the pulpit. <laughs> you are three people in one. Three people. Three. <laughs> there's three parts to you. Okay. When this is resting, the rest of you is still at work, is it not? Yeah. We're in some la-la land dreaming or whatever the case may be. So I don't understand the big, the big mystery about the Trinity. Now, obviously, he's God and it's different. Well, well, Jesus, how could Jesus be God if he hung on the cross? And Well, the same as the person whose body has a stroke or has cerebral palsy is completely broken in fellowship from their mind. The person still thinks, they still can reason, but something is not communicating. There's a breakdown between the two. But they're still the same person. So, this is what's going on. So an angel, though, doesn't have that. Angels are not created in the image and likeness of God. Did you know that? So they live on a different plane than we do. I did not get into, intend to get into angelology this morning, but apparently the Lord wants us to go there. They were not created in the image and likeness of God. You and I are unique in all of creation because we are. Nothing else in creation, and I mean by creation, not just this world, but what you see up there in the sky. You and I are the only thing in creation that is absolutely unique because we are like God. The ability to communicate with Him, the ability to take that communication to communicate with others, and the ability to, to function within one another in the physical realm. That's why hugs are important. So for those people that when you go to hug them, they go... I just gave that person a seizure. Wow. But anyway, yeah, I hug them any dang ways. But that's, that's the, see, that's that contact. That's the physical, the spiritual aspect of this. When I die, this is staying behind temporarily, and you guys will be burying it, right? Or putting it into ashtrays, you know? <laughs> me, I'll have to have three or four my size. Some of you guys, a little half one, but me, I'm going to be big. There'll be three of me standing on the mantle. You get the idea. Because this is going. But you know what? I'm going to be every bit as alive as I am right now. You see, this is not the reality, you guys. It isn't. This is not the reality. How do I know? Because it used to not stretch. <laughs> I used to be able to go do this with my hair, and I actually felt hair. Now I just keep going. It hurts my shoulders now. I have to go farther back. <laughs> this is not going to last. Anybody disagree? Speak now or forever. Hold your peace. Things are not getting better. I was out playing catch with Rick and Asher yesterday, playing baseball. Baseball season's back on. And boy, in my mind, I could still catch and pew. But I tell you what, I catch and I throw and I, <laughs> so I, I go to try to catch a ball and my, my mind is going, yeah, stretch out and my legs are going, no. <laughs> it's not working. 
anymore. Things don't work like they used to work. Right? Things are stretching. So, so this, and yet what is it that we spend most of the time on? This. Go figure. The scripture says, no, 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 don't worry about that. That is temporal. The rest of you is not. And then when you leave this behind, God said, don't worry about it because I created you in my image and like this, so it has to be changed. But there's a point at which I will do that. Someday this is going to look like God intended it to look. It doesn't look that way now. Now Marie thinks it does. I'm not just kidding. <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. So angels are different. So this angel that appears, he appears in the form of a man. But he's not a man. He's not in the image and likeness of God. God just for whatever reason decides to use these guys as a man. Terry was talking about it earlier. Paul himself writes, be careful, man. Be careful what you do because a lot of times there have been people who have had hung out with angels and they had no clue they were doing so. Well, that was a scary thought, huh? That's why we wonder about that guy on the street. You know, now don't go looking for angels, you know. I'm not saying that. Go pinch these guys, see if your hand goes through. Oh, you're an angel. No. I'm just saying that, you know, just be aware. So he stands before and notice in bright clothing. He's been in the presence for God. He's a messenger for God, for goodness sakes. He's an angel. That's all the word means. It's a messenger. God said, you, this is probably Gabriel, again, because it's concerning uh, salvation, therefore the Lord Jesus Christ. And Gabriel always is used to speak of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is, we're pretty certain, there's no way to know for sure, but it would appear that this is probably Gabriel. Okay? So Gabriel shows up, he's been sent from the presence of God, and he stands before this guy, and this guy, all of a sudden, after all these years and all this struggle and all this wanting to really know, all of a sudden, there's a being standing in front of him. Notice that he didn't bow down to the angel like he did to Peter. And, and the angel says this, and this is what he's explaining, the bright clothing. And this is what their messenger said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. God has been listening to you, Cornelius. I know you didn't think so. We never think like we talked about last week. Oftentimes it seems like God isn't listening. What do I have to do, Lord, to get you to listen to me? We're so sure that he's not hearing us. Or because we've been bad Rick, bad Rick. And so God says, well, I'm not going to listen to you. Or I'm not going to respond until you get this straightened out. This is the view we take, isn't it? Because that's how we do in a, home, in a human experience with our kids. When there's problems, there's broken fellowship. But we're talking about God here. God knows us. He knows every thought. He knows every motive. He knows everything not only that we've done, but everything that we'll do. And he still loves us. Figure that one out. And he loves every human being on the planet. That's what that verse right there says. God so loved the world. The world that spits in his face and shakes his fist at him. We will not listen to you. We don't want you in our schools. We don't want you in our courts. We're going to find a way to replace you and call it science. We're going to do all of these things. In our country that founded in God, well, we're going to believe in God and then God does this. Well, pff, you know, 9-11 happens or the stuff we see happening now. Pff, God, yeah, right. You know, where is God? Where is God? And God's in the same place he's always been. He's always, and he's listening. He hears every cry of a heart. He does. But he'll answer when he sees fit, when he knows it's best. As parents, anybody that's a parent, you know this. You tell your kids, listen, I'm listening. I know what you're saying. But this is not the time. You know, there's going to come a point when this will happen, and then you're going to go, oh. But that's what's happening. Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. The other thing I loved about this, which we pointed out last week, he knows my name. It's not like, hey, you big chubby guy there in Mesquite. Uh, what was your name? No, he knows who I am. He knows my name. Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. And your alms are remembered. In other words, the things you've done on behalf of others are remembered in the sight of God. Not only has God heard you, he knows what you've been doing. Can you imagine being Cornelius and thinking like this? I can, because that's exactly where I was. 
I was stunned when I found out that God had been listening to me all those years. Even when I was silent, inside, I knew. But I was afraid to cry out because I, didn't, you know, I wanted to be cool. I wanted to be acceptable. I wanted to be understood by my friends and my family. And I mean, I don't want to be like one of these nutbolt Christians walking around out there. Some Bible thumpers, born againers. <laughs> Funny, I'm doing all those things now. <laughs> anyway, um, never say never. Anyway, so, so he said, listen, God is a, send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging at the house of Simon. We all know this. So I sent to you immediately, and you, and you have done well to come. That doesn't mean, good job, Peter. <laughs> it means Peter, he's like, Peter, I can't believe you're here. You really came. Wow. I mean, he's stunned. And we're all present before God. I love this. He's starting to get it now, even Cornelius. So we're all here. We're not here before you. I love that. We're, not, we're all present before God. And here you go again. You want to make sure that, know now that he understands it has nothing to do with Peter, but the God of Peter. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded, by, commanded you by God. We're not here to hear your words, Peter. Sound like a really cool dude, but you know what? We're not interested in what you have to say. We want to hear what God has to say. Clearly, God has something to say to us from you, or he wouldn't have done all this stuff in advance. Okay, quickly now. Then Peter opened up his mouth and he said, and I love this, this is where Peter's just, he's just stripped down. Everything that he thought that he understood has just been, just, just been moved out of the way. You know? He was so sure that what he believed was the right thing and all of a sudden he finds out, nah, not so much. There are some things that have to change. So Peter opens his mouth and he said, in truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. I mean, it's obvious, you guys, that God wants you to hear what he has to say, whether you're Jew or Gentile. But in every nation, there is the word Gentiles. See, this is what the Jews fail to understand. This is exactly what Abraham's God said. That's why I'll take Abraham's God, not the Jews' God. Big difference. And he said, Abraham, it's through you that the nations will be blessed. And here it is. We're talking couple of thousand years down the road here it was little by little the nations were starting to get how much the God of Israel was you know was who was really God but this is the time and, and Peter now is starting to get it Peter's standing in the position to to actually bring to begin to bring the fulfillment of God's words to Abraham in you all the families of the earth will be blessed this is it this is where it begins that's unbelievable. From this point on, things would never be the same. Never be the same. So in every nation, whoever fears him and, and works righteousness is accepted by him. In other words, they have an understanding of who he is. And that causes them to act in a way that pleases him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. Notice, he is Lord over all. This is Peter's message. He's going to give the whole scope. Now, I don't have time to develop all this. I had planned on doing that until I ran myself out of time. Um, but anyway, if you read the Gospel of Mark, you have to remember, Mark was a cousin to Peter. Okay, young fella. We're going to meet Mark here in a little bit. Um, not overly stable to begin with, but ended up being a great guy. But because he was a cousin of Peter, he had followed Peter around, and he had recorded, recorded Peter's teaching. And then he put Peter's teaching into a format, and we call it Mark's Gospel. It's been believed for, for centuries that Mark's Gospel is actually everything that Peter taught. And you can see that as we move through this, if you understand the structure of Mark. Because it's different than Matthew, Luke, and John. Mark is different. And the reason what Peter is going to give us here in the next few things is exactly what the Gospel of Mark does. It's amazing. So in every nation, or I'm sorry, the verse 36, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. And this phrase right here, he is Lord of all. Now, Peter's a Jew. He's understood who Jesus is and certainly is Lord. But to Peter, it would have been Messiah. He doesn't lose, use Messiah. Very interesting because he's not speaking to a Jewish crowd. He's speaking to a Gentile crowd. So he uses the word kurios. Okay, which is Lord. We get the word Lord from it. 
And it can just mean sir, but in this case, it's clear um, that, that this guy is not just a sir or mister. This is the Lord, okay? He's the, he's the guy. But he doesn't use Messiah. So here's, here's uh, the, the preaching through Jesus Christ. Says, Lord, that the word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea. Notice, you know this. You understand this. You're, you're not, I'm not talking to you about something you don't understand. And began from Galilee after the baptism which John had preached. So, so Cornelius had been in this area at least since John's baptism of Jesus, which is roughly 12 to 15 years. That's about how long this had taken. And everybody was aware of this. Peter knew that Cornelius himself, a Roman commander, knew about all of these things. And that's what he's saying here. I'm, not, I'm just sort of rehearsing what you already know. You also know how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. How do you know he was anointed? Well, he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. How do we know? Because he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Now, we see the devil and we think horns, you know, rock and roll thing. You know. But anyway, um, but... But what the actual word here is, remember, remember here, diabolos, which of course is a diabolical one. It means slanderer. This is how, how Cornelius would have heard it, the one who slanders. Okay? Wouldn't have thought of a little horned, you know, pitchfork-tailed guy. That's not what he would have seen. And that's what he's talking about here. So God, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, and then Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now, what did we just explain there in one verse? Father, Holy Spirit, and the Son. He's developing the concept of the Trinity that they're all working together as one. Okay? With God being the one that's, you know, that's kind of, you know, making sure this all takes place. For God was with him. And we, now remember, he's there with six other guys. But he's, but he's talking here. And he's, uh, uh, so the we are witnesses, he's not talking about the other guys, he's talking about the apostles, okay? Because those other six from Joppa that had journeyed with him, the next things can't be said about them. So he knows that we here, he's, he's talking about, is the twelve. And we are witnesses of all the things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. He uses an interesting word here. He didn't use the Roman word for crucify, which he certainly could have done. He's stuck into a Roman, but he doesn't. See, he he's want, doesn't want any of the blame game going on. And so he says, no, he, he was hung on a tree, literally, is the word wood. He was hung on wood, as you well know, Cornelius. And even though he was hung on this, and this was the intention of those that opposed him, uh, in spite of that, God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. Now, this is really significant, because no doubt Cornelius had heard all of these things, and he understood this. And could this, could this Jesus of Nazareth be God's answer to this? I mean... Now I'm getting reports that he rose from the dead and stuff. But you see, there's no proof, you guys, from Cornelius' perspective. And little, little, you know, little myths start real easy and spread really fast. And that's why Peter's taking the time to do this. Him, God's raised up to the third day. And he's no mist. He's no myth, Cornelius. He's no, he's no hearsay or, or you, know, uh, you know, the little, you know, what do you call that when, shoot. Anyway, you get the idea. There's a realist. Because God showed him openly. Not to all the people. But to witnesses chosen before a God. Paul tells us there was 500 of them that Jesus showed up to. That saw him physically after his death. Now if you're Cornelius, you're going, whoa, I'd heard about this resurrection thing. But you never really know, you know. I want it to be true. But it's just word. And until there's, a, there's proof. Well, there's proof. Here's one that was there. And apparently 500 others. Now notice what he says. But he didn't do this to all peoples, but to the witness chosen before by God. Of course, they were the first to see him with the ladies. And notice this. Even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. Now you can just see Cornelius going, oh my gosh. Even after the resurrection, you shared a meal? Absolutely, dude. I'm telling you, it was the coolest thing I've ever seen. I mean, you can imagine this. See, Cornelius now knows God sent an angel to tell him to go get Peter. Peter's not going to be telling a story or a myth. This is reality. Peter says, dude, I'm telling you, man, we not only saw him, we sat down and had a meal with him. We ate with him. Oh, my gosh. And then he said, and he commanded us to preach to the people and testify that he is, uh, that it is he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Uh-oh. 
You see, he's not just someone raised from the dead. He's also in a position of authority. And if he's in the position of being and setting in judgment over both those that are alive and those that are dead, this can be none other than God. Because only God can do that. Okay? To him, all the prophets witness that. So that through his name, whoever believes in him receives remission of sins. And there it is. That's all it takes. Just believe. While Peter was still speaking these words, he was just saying this. He hadn't even gotten to an altar call. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Now notice the first word, while Peter was still speaking these words, is the Greek word rima, and it means making a report. So he was giving an account, in other words. The Holy Spirit fell on those who heard the lagas. This word. It's amazing that when you teach how you're giving a report, but you guys are hearing God's word. Does that make sense? God takes what, people, what us teachers have to say, and he will speak to you exactly where you are with what he wants you to know. Even though I may have never said it, it is amazing. And when God does it for us, it stuns you. It's just the biz most bizarre feeling and stuff. Because, uh, you know, and I shared with, this, with you guys this a little bit in the past. I'll be up teaching. Off, oftentimes this happens. And, you know, you've read, you've prepared, you've got all your notes, and, you know, you're ready to go, and, you know, it's all in your mind. You've slept on it, you got up, you thought of it, you prayed about it in the morning, and here you are, and you're up here teaching and stuff. And all of a sudden, stuff starts to come out of your mouth that you didn't talk about, you didn't prepare for. It was, and it's just coming out of your mouth, and you find yourself kind of in the background listening to yourself, and you just go, Wow, that was amazing. Great point. Not that I'm making a great point, but the words, that's a great point. And then all of a sudden you snap to and you go, oh my gosh. And you kind of in the background, you guys don't know this unless you see me do stuff like this. <laughs> it's like, it's like, Lord, that's you, huh? And he just goes, yeah, just let me run with this. And you just go, okay. And you stand back and just look out at the crowd and stuff keeps coming out of your mouth and you're just in the background just going, this is awesome. Nobody knows. So if I ever do this in church, <laughs> and the Lord said, <laughs> no, it ain't going to be freaky like that, man. <laughs> it's God. No, it just happens. But when it's you that it's happening to, you just go, oh my gosh. You always ask God to take control, and then when he does, it blows you away. It's the weirdest thing, but it's cool. It's way cool. Anyway, so, they heard, so this is happening, and all of a sudden, then they hear God's word, even though Peter's just given a report. It's God's word that they heard. And those of the circumcision who believe were astonished, the Jews. These are Christian Jews, but they still think in law. They're in a Gentile's house. Everything is going crazy. What's happening in our world? You see? And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit falls on these guys, and they're like, oh my goodness. They were astonished as many came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on them also. It's like, what? What is going on here? They don't understand. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. <clears throat> then Peter answered, and he explained this to them. But notice what they did. Remember Pentecost. God had empowered the apostles to speak to the Jews first, and he had given them the ability to communicate with the Jews who were not from Jerusalem. He had given them the ability to communicate in what we call tongues. Now, there's other aspects to it, but this is the, was the incident when the context. There were Jews that had come from Rome, Jews that come from Germany, that come from Italy, come from China, blah, 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 blah. They're all Jews. They're back in Israel for the Passover because they're Jews, but they don't understand Hebrew. And yet God had equipped Peter and the apostles to speak to each one of them in their own language. That's why the people says, what the heck is going on here? We're hearing them talk our own languages. And these guys live in Jerusalem. That was to the Jews. Look at what's happened. The same thing. But this time to the Gentiles. Oh, because there's a new plan. It's amazing. These guys now are probably given the ability to communicate the gospel in all of the language of the Roman Empire. Isn't that amazing? Think about that. You're talking Persian. You're talking Arab. You're talking uh, Aramaic. You're talking uh, Italian and Spanish and Greek. And holy cow, they went up into Germania. They speak English over in the UK. The French, the Gauls. 
all of the languages, all the peoples that Rome had conquered by the sword. Now these guys are going to go and conquer with the power of God and the power of their words as God enables them the ability to go and speak the truth in all of those foreign lands. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And then Peter, as you can imagine, he's done with his sermon now. He recognizes, as I'm trying to be, um, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And then, of course, he commands them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they asked him to stay a few days. Peter's saying, you guys, it's pretty dang obvious what's happened here. Now notice, all of this happened. Their, their salvation happened by the preaching of the word of God. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit happened prior to baptism. We always, a lot of churches make it the opposite way. You can't do anything until you're baptized. Well, call me crazy. We just read it different. And the last verse, and I want to close with this because this is really cool. And he that is Cornelius, I love this, or I'm sorry, Peter, commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And then Cornelius and them, they asked him to stay for a few days. And we know from history that they did stay for some time. Now, real, one last point here, what I think is way cool about this. Do you remember Philip? who really went out from Jerusalem and went out and the Holy Spirit came to Philip and he said, hey, head out west, or go, go east out of Jerusalem. So the Spirit goes, okay. Whoop. And so Philip's running through the desert. He's run through there and he sees an African guy on a chariot and the Holy Spirit says, go hook up with that chariot. So Philip runs over there and, and we know what happened, right? The salvation of the Ethiopian. And of course, he's baptized, by the way, after the preaching of the word, after he receives the truth. And then there's the preaching, right? I mean, and then there's the baptism. And the next words we read is that Philip then was found in Nazaras, another city on the coast. And that from there he went to where? Caesarea. And if you remember, what we said at that point is, we know that after the incident with them, and uh, with the Ethiopian and Azadis, that Philip went up to um, Caesarea, and that he was up there for a long time. Because when we get to the 25th chapter, we're going to see Paul is going to commend him and his two young daughters. So what's really cool about this is after all this has happened, Philip was already in Caesarea, probably preaching the gospel as well but probably is shying away from the Roman commander, for goodness sake. And all of a sudden, this has all happened. If you don't think Peter looked Philip up and said, Philip, you got to come here and see what the Lord is doing. And it is believed, we don't know, but it is believed that Philip, because we know he'd stay on for a long time, that Philip would become the pastor of the church at Caesarea, of which Cornelius, his servants, and his household, and some of his troops attended. How cool is that? That is way cool. You see, God is always at work. But the most important thing for us, you guys, is He's always listening. He hears every cry of your heart. Don't stop crying out. Don't. And don't ever think that He's not answering. He's answering. You just don't know it yet. Okay? He will answer. I know we want it in our time frame. Well, Lord, I've been praying about this, and if it doesn't happen by this, then I'm going to, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do, blah, 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 and stuff. You put God on the timeline, God, I think God just kind of goes, <laughs> really? And then later on, when that actually happens, and you gave up prayer, you're reminded that, wow, I gave up prayer from there to here, and it happened anyways, and then God just goes, told you. Don't stop. No matter how rough things are, don't give up. He hears. And he knows the things that we do that have come up before him. And he also knows the things we do that dishonor him. But he will never turn us away. Never turn us away. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. It's impossible. Because he's the God of love. Of, of the agape love, not just emotionals. Right? So, incredible story. We're going to see this accounted one more time, believe it or not. This time, though, Peter's going to do it in front of the Jews in Jerusalem. And some of them are going to be upset. Peter... What the crud were you thinking going into the homes of the Gentiles? That's what's going to happen. And then Peter's going to say, well, boys, listen to this. And then he's going to tell them all of this. And it's going to be James, the Lord's stepbrother, that's going to go, wow. And it's going to lead over to chapter 15. And James is going to make a, make a standard as the pastor of the church of Jerusalem that's going to say, listen, God's doing this stuff in the Gentiles. We are not putting the law of Moses on these people. Not for circumcision, not for the Sabbath, not for the, the Ten Commandments, for nothing. Obviously, God has done this, and we're going to let God be God in these people's lives. That's what he said. There were some changes afoot. The gospel is spreading. Amen? We still have the responsibility to spread it. Now, one last thing before we go. 
we are moving into the to the uh, Easter season. We know um, we just talked about baptism. You guys know uh, Easter Sunday we do our morning service, and then we do baptisms out here, and then we have a big day with the you know the barbecue and the fish fry and all that stuff. Some of you I know have talked to me about baptisms, so in the next week or two you need to get with me about that because I told you I always do. You're going to have to remind me because I will forget. I forgot. But I know there are some of you out there that want to do that, okay? So you need to hook up with me so we can get this all lined up so we can sit down with these folks in, in preparation of that day for baptism. It's a really cool day. So don't forget, okay, about the baptism thing. If you know someone or, or, uh, or, you know, or yourself that haven't been baptized yet, then we'll do that. Amen? All right, let's stand. We'll close.